Hello everyone. Um, I would like to start all the lectures, at least for the next few weeks, with a case history. <clears throat> and uh, so I'm going to cover case history, a geotechnical engineering case history, and then I'll move on to talk about uh, site investigation, which is a topic of uh, today's lecture. And the case history that I've uh, selected uh, is uh, the Tower of Pisa. Uh, so we're going to talk about the Tower of Pisa. Well, if you give me a chance, I'll go turn off the lights and then we'll uh, follow the slides. So the, the Tower of Pisa uh, was probably uh, the most successful failure in geotechnical engineering that we've ever experienced. Uh, it's probably brought more money through tourism to the city of Pisa uh, than anything else. Um, uh, but it goes back to 1173 when the construction of the tower started and then the tower was completed in 1370 or some 200 years uh, later. So it took a good while to be able to build that tower. I started with credits and here this gives me a chance to uh, tell you that it's critically important whenever you use illustration or text from other sources to acknowledge the source of the material that you're uh, uh, taking and, and uh, using in your own, uh, in your own uh, document or your own work. Uh, it's called uh, having respect for intellectual property. Uh, you know, it's like going to uh, Walmart and grabbing a television and going out the door without paying. The, the, it's stealing, uh, except in this case, uh, it's stealing the work of others. And, and so it's critically important to give uh, recognition to the material that you might uh, take from other sources. So that's what this is uh, all about here. So here is the, uh, the tower, and the, the tower is uh, on bottom left here. This is the uh, Piazza di Miracoli in uh, Pisa in Italy. Uh, and you typically come and park uh, top, uh, top of the uh, picture, and you come uh, on the right side, on the left side there, that, uh, and the tower is at the bottom left here. And there is a, a cathedral. Uh, as well as you can see and the baptistry, and both the baptistry and the, the cathedral uh, settle quite a bit as well. If you look on the uh, on on this side of the tower, you can see that uh, there has been a significant amount of settlement that took place. The ground surface is right here, and the tower went down quite a bit and it tilted because of the slenderness of the structure. Uh, the, the, the pressure under the cathedral may be about the same, but the cathedral just went down because it's a very broad and, and stocky uh, structure, whereas the tower is fairly slender, and so the uh, high pressure coupled with the slenderness of the structure led it to um, to tilt. So here is the construction sequence. Uh, we're starting in, uh, on the left uh, side of the, the axis in 1170 and three stories are built and at that time the structure starts to tilt and the construction is abandoned until oh, another almost a hundred years later when uh, an additional three stories is uh, completed. But then at that time, again, the structure starts to tilt significantly, and so construction is abandoned, and it's only around the middle of the 13th century that uh, uh, around 1350, uh, the, uh, the 12th century, rather, that uh, the structure is completed. It weighs 140 mega newton. 
So here is the inclination as a function of time. This is uh, the top part is inclination versus time. The bottom part is settlement versus time. If you look at settlement, uh, you can see that during the first period of construction, it went down about one meter. During the second portion of construction, it went down an additional 1.5 meter. And then in the, when the structure was completed, but overall, you can see that over that almost 1,000 year period, uh, the structure has settled close to four meters, which is very significant amount of settlement. We certainly wouldn't tolerate this for any uh, current design. And the tilt, which is the upper part of the plot, shows that we have about five and a half degrees of tilt for that structure. So here's the cross section, uh, and on the uh, uh, on the left hand side, you can see the size of the structure, about 20 meters circular foundation and about 60 meter high tower. The, the Eiffel, to give you an idea, the Eiffel Tower is 300 meters. So the Pisa Tower is not very tall, uh, but certainly very famous. On the right hand side, you see the cross section of what we call the soil stratigraphy. And uh, you have a lot of silts and clays and sand in a bed. Uh, and we will talk about what these are and how we we uh, identify these uh, types of soil. And the groundwater level is quite high. The water in the soil is, is quite high. Here is a typical uh, uh, set of profiles about soil strength and, and uh, uh, stresses in the soil. So the first uh, profile is uh, stratigraphy, the second one that's labeled Q sub C at the top in megapascal is the cone penetrometer point resistance. We'll talk about this uh, later on during this lecture, but it's a, it's a test where we push a rod in the ground and it gives you an idea of the strength uh, and, and the layering of uh, the material. Uh, the second profile is called the OCR, or over consolidation ratio. It gives you a sense of how pre-stressed the material is. And you can see that uh, the OCR is higher towards the top than towards the bottom. And then the, the one on the right hand side is the stress in the, in the soil uh, below the ground surface down to about 40 some meters and the stress uh, increases with depth as you can imagine and there is also uh, this uh, stress called the pre-consolidation pressure which again gives you an idea of the pre-stressing of this uh, material. So we'll learn about all these things uh, during this class um, and, uh, and, and at the end of the uh, of the course, then you will have a better idea of what these numbers uh, mean. So, uh, around uh, 1990, the, the Italian government uh, thought that the structure was leaning too much and, and uh, at an alarming rate and decided that it should be closed to the public and that something should be done about the town. There was a competition that uh, took place um, to try to collect ideas as to what remedy might be uh, the best way of, uh, of course, they didn't want to put the tower straight because then uh, the tourism would probably decrease significantly. So they didn't want to put it straight, but they wanted to make sure that uh, it wouldn't continue to lean and increase in the leaning process. So the the. The idea that won the, uh, the competition was to put some lead blocks on the high side of the tower because the weight of those lead blocks would actually generate a moment that would counterbalance the moment due to the weight of the tower. And uh, that was a temporary solution because obviously it's not very uh, uh, elegant uh, a solution, 
So while they were thinking about another way to solve the problem, then these lead uh, weights uh, temporarily helped out. The solution that was retained was to excavate soil from under the high side of the, uh, of the structure. And you can see on the, uh, on the left there, the set of uh, casing that were prepared so that this drill right here, the red drill, could actually come in those casings and drill the soil from, from the tower. So you see the, the tower is right here, and then the, the casings are leading and the drill is going under the tower and excavating the, the green part here a uh, little bit at a time, very gently, under the high side of the tower so that it would actually uh, make the high side of the tower settle and in that process it would uh, uh, prevent it from leaning further and even try to redress it to some extent. So this is the results of this uh, uh, repair of the tower. If you look, so this is south right here and this is north and you can see that because they were drilling on this side here, uh, this side, the north side, went down quite a bit. This is in millimeters, settlement in millimeters, and we're looking at about 180 or 200 uh, millimeters um, that they're going down. So that's a fair amount of, of excavation. And meanwhile, because there was no drilling, no excavation on the south side, then the south side did not go down at all, and that helped to redress the, uh, the, the tower. So when, when you look at the history of the tower's inclination at the top, uh, the top uh, diagram there, you have uh, the number of degrees of inclination, and uh, recall that there was a first period of, of construction and then a second period and a third period and by the time you got to uh, some uh, close to the year 2000 you were at 5.5 degrees of inclination and then this uh, little glitch that goes back up right here if you can see my mouse uh, this little glitch here is the result of this excavation process. So the idea is that by this excavation process, the red line goes back up to a position where the tower was around 1800. Uh, so that the, the story goes that this repair technique uh, gave the, the tower or, or uh, uh, decreased the age of the tower by about 200 years, and it's back to where it used to be about 200 years ago. So of course, if you go there, uh, you'll probably take that uh, funny picture. Where, where, uh, and then these are the, the three uh, people, the three engineers, geotechnical engineers, that uh, contributed the most to this uh, redressing of the Tower of Pisa, Mike Shamirovkoski, uh, John Berlin, and Carlo Vigiani, all uh, good friends of mine, and a uh, really remarkable team. You can imagine that if you're given the charge of uh, repairing the Tower of Pisa, you cannot fail. And so the pressure on those three uh, engineers was remarkable. And when they started excavating under the high side of the tower, the pressure was high, and, and in fact, at first, uh, there were some difficult moments, but they succeeded, and this has been, a, in my mind, a remarkable success. Very good. Well, let me put the light back on. And then we will proceed with talking about uh, site investigation.
And of course, site investigation is tremendously important. Uh, there was no such thing back in 1170 when the Tower of Pisa uh, got uh, started and, and uh, let alone design of foundations at that time. You know, the engineer, probably, or engineer, the person in charge of construction probably went, uh, yeah, I think that's going to be okay. And then, uh, and then uh, th there's even a, a cartoon in, uh, I think, uh, Bill Lamb's uh, a textbook that uh, where the, the fellow talks to the, the owner and says, uh, I skimped a little bit on the foundation, but nobody will ever know. And, and of course, that wasn't quite right. All right, so site investigation, very important. It's always the first step in any geotechnical work project. Um, and so we, we uh, I want to show you a uh, typical uh, flowchart, if you wish, of what happens when... Uh, so let's say that uh, you have, so we're talking about site investigations. Very first step in a uh, geotechnical project. And the first, so let's say that uh, uh, you now own a geotechnical company and the phone rings and uh, a client says, I want you to design the foundation for this big bank building that I'm uh, in charge of. Uh, so how do you go about this? So first thing, you have a geotechnical project. And this geotechnical project, you, uh, the first thing that you do is you do a preliminary, if the project is large enough, you do a preliminary investigation. So you might go, that might involve uh, collecting uh, maps, uh, geological maps, trying to understand um, what uh, prior use uh, there was for the site. For example, you might discover that uh, 50 years ago there was a landfill at that location and then you say, whoa, if that's the case then uh, I'm trying to build on garbage and, and you're going to be very careful. So these sorts of things, you can do that by going to City Hall or checking the, the geologic uh, maps. And then you go with the main investigation. And the main investigation is where you go to the field. So th this first one, the preliminary investigation, this is something you can do in, the, in an office, in your office. Uh, by reaching out and calling people as so well. The main investigation is when you go to the field and once you're in the field, uh, you have two choices. So you go to the field typically with a drill rig, uh, a water truck, and uh, the engineer uh, vehicle. Uh, the main investigation typically is broken down into uh, sampling. So you collect sample or field testing, we call them in situ testing. So in the case of sampling, and I'll, I'll tell you more about this in a minute. In the case of, of sampling, you're going to be drilling a hole, pushing a tube, and you collect a sample. And that sample, you put it on the truck, you wrap it, you, you make sure you don't lose moisture, and you don't disturb the soil, and then you bring it back to the lab. So then when you do the sampling, you've got to come back to the lab and do here the lab 
test. Okay, so these are the lab tests. And that's what you're going to be doing. A lot of the uh, elementary uh, lab tests that we do as geotechnical engineers, that's what you're going to be doing in, in, with your lab sections um, in the semester. In situ tests are tests that we do in the field. Uh, they're tests that, uh, and I'll, I'll tell you more about those uh, in a minute. But once you have the lab test results and the institute test design uh, results, uh, then you do your geotechnical design. So this is geotech design. Because these tests, be it lab tests or institute tests, give you the parameters that allow you to, to do the design. You saw some of those parameters for the Tower of Pisa. We had the, uh, the stress in the ground, the pre-consolidation pressure, the cone penetrometer resistance, but this is typically how a project uh, develops and this, depending on the size of the project, this may take uh, uh, two weeks uh, to six months or, or a year. Sometimes when the geotechnical design comes out and uh, you go back to the client, you say, well, look, you know, I cannot get by with shallow foundation for this big structure. I've got to do piles on the basis of the data that I've collected. Uh, and then the client said, well, that's very expensive. Uh, can we get by with shallow foundation? And then you say, well, if we go back to the site and we do more advanced investigation and more sophisticated tests, then maybe we can get by with the shallow foundation, but you need to invest a little bit more money uh, and, and you may have to pay another $10,000 to save potentially $200,000. So when that happens, that means that there is a loop that takes place between the geotech design and the site investigation right here. So you go back to the, uh, to the, uh, to the site and you do more advanced testing and then maybe that allows you to demonstrate uh, that uh, you can get by with the shallow foundation. All right, so that's the typical uh, uh, set of, uh, of steps that take place in this case. Let me now talk about these two things here, sampling and in situ testing, because that's part of the investigation. The lab tests we will talk later on in the course, and you will do some of those on your own. So let's go to let's go to uh, sampling. So if I talk about sampling, how do we collect samples? Well, we go to the to the site, and at the site we have a drill rig. and this drill rig is a truck and the truck has um, there is a pump and there is a uh, uh, number of pieces of equipment there is a uh, mast and the mast has rods so you have uh, rods that come down and then at the end of the rods you have a drill bit, okay? And then here you have a turntable, right here. And this turntable, there is a rod that goes, the Kelly bar goes through the turntable, the turntable turns, and so that forces the rods to turn, and that rotates the drilling bit. Meanwhile, there is typically so that drills a hole that looks like this, 
and there is typically water that goes through the center of the rods and around the, the outside and this flow of water is bringing the cuttings that you're generating at the bottom of the drill bit back to the surface in what is called the mud pit. And these cuttings then clean, so you end up with a clean uh, hole, and then you go back into this hole, so you remove the rods out of the hole, and you go back in the hole, and you change the end of the rods into a tube. So this tube is about 75 millimeters in diameter. It's about 0 0.6, 0 0.7 meters long. And then with the rods, you have a jack. That turntable also acts as a jack. And you're pushing the rods, and that pushes the tube into the soil. Okay. So this gets to be full of soil. And then you pull it back out of the, uh, out of the ground. And that green tube here is what you bring back to the laboratory. Actually, on site typically you have an extruder, so you have a, the, the extruder grabs the tube and pushes the soil out of the tube. You collect the soil, you wrap it, saran wrap or whatever, plastic film, and so you don't lose the moisture. And then you send this in the, uh, to the lab for various types of tests. We'll see what those tests are all about. This is typically what we do for clay. For sand, we uh, use another technique. Uh, so this is called a Shelby tube. We'll call it thin, thin wall steel tube. Okay. When, uh, and so that's for clay, as I mentioned here. In the case of sand, we do another test. So we, uh, same, uh, same drill rig. the winch and all that uh, and we still have the mast and then behind the mast we now have a hammer so we still have the rods uh, and the rods go into an open hole to the bottom of the open hole so we've drilled the hole first and we're right here and then at the bottom of the rods we have a sampler it's different from this one it's uh, it's stronger actually and this one is called the split spoon sampler so from time to time, when I uh, when I talk to you, I'm gonna out, I'm gonna point out what could be on the midterm or could be on the final. Might be a good idea for you to make a note of this so that when you prepare for the midterm, uh, you you have already highlighted, if you wish, the things that I said had a good chance to be on the midterm. <laughs> so for example, um, the, uh, the the question could be. What is a spring spoon sampler? And so you, the answer would be, it is a, it is a, a sampler that's used to collect samples of sand. Right. Uh, we drive this sampler with a hammer. And the hammer uh, weighs 140 pounds and it falls 30 inches 
140 pounds, that's, uh, that's the size of a person, the weight of a person, and uh, 30 inches is about this much. And so uh, there is a rope that actually goes from the cat head here all over the pulley and uh, brings, so there's somebody, I mean in the old times you pull the rope, uh, now it's an automated system, but it generates a certain amount of energy and one of the things that comes out of this test as well is the number of blows per foot of penetration. And that is the N value. The N value is the number of blows per foot of penetration. So you're here, you're standing there, and you have a mark and you can see how much the rod is going down each time, and you're counting the number of blows, and these number of blows vary from 5 to 50, let's say. 50 would be a very dense sand, and 5 would be a very loose sand. And you record those, this uh, number, and that's a number that you can use in design to get uh, the, the strength of the sand uh, and so on. Here we tend to take the thin wall steel tube, extrude the sample, bring it back to the lab. So this would be leading to a laboratory test. This number right here would be an in-situ test because we actually do the test in the field. But we also get some samples a uh, disturbed sample of sand that we collect in plastic bags and we bring them back to the lab to do brain size analysis and, and some of the tests that you will do yourself in the lab. This is sampling. Now I need to talk about in-situ testing. So in situ testing, uh, there are a number of tests. Of course, this one being the first uh, test, in situ test. So the one I just described here is kind of a, this is called the standard penetration test, or SPT for short. So a question on midterm could be, what is an SPT? Uh, it's a standard penetration test, an in situ test used to test sand. Another test that uh, we can use is the cone penetrometer test. Cone penetrometer penetrometer test. So the abbreviation here is CPT. Again, what is a CPT? Cone penetrometer test. And I want to describe how this thing works. Instead of a drill rig here, we have a truck. Well, it's a dedicated truck and the truck weighs, and it weighs about uh, 20 tons, so it's pretty heavy. And you're pushing a rod in the ground. So if I zoom in right here, then I would see something that looked like this, full scale, like that like that, and at the end, there is a point. That's why it's called the cone penetration test. And we measure two things. One, the load that is carried by the point. So we have some strain gauges that are measuring that load here. And we divide by the area, and that gives us what is called Q sub C, the point resistance. Q sub C, was part of the profiles that I showed you in the site 
uh, investigation of the Tower of Pisa. Now that contract, uh, the cone penetration test started around 1935 in the Netherlands and then uh, it was mechanical at the time and it became more sophisticated, the uh, strain gauges were developed. Uh, today a cone truck costs probably around $400,000, uh, but it's an extremely useful test and we can do the profiles that you saw in the Tower Pisa data, which probably was obtained in uh, 1990 uh, or, or later. The other thing we get from this test is this the side friction, F sub S, the friction on the side, because we've got another strain gauge right here. <laughs> and uh, uh, we're able to isolate one from the other. The result of this test is a profile versus depth of Q sub C and then other profile of F sub S. So this profile may look, uh, I don't know, something like this, something hard, something up, and suddenly something hard again. And then in parallel, well, the friction might be very similar. So they give you uh, similar results uh, in both cases. And so here, you might look at this profile and you might say, aha, I have a strong layer right about here. Uh, so maybe I could put my foundation on that layer, but is the layer thick enough that I can count on the strength of that layer? Well, if the building is that big, that's probably not thick enough. So you'd be better off going down here to put your foundation. And this tool tells us, this profiling tool tells us, is very helpful. And we collect this, the penetration rate here is two centimeters per second. So this thing goes pretty fast. So it's coming down at that rate. So you collect data quite fast and continuously. Uh, this test, the SPT, uh, you, you collect data over one foot or so of penetration, but it's discontinuous so that the profile that you would get from an SPT would look something like this, that's depth, and that's the row count M. And then you would have a data point right here, data point right there, data point right here, data point right there, and then you would say, okay, that's the profile that I get from this test. It's a discontinuous profile that you get from the uh, SPT. So here we get the N value, number of rows per foot. Here we get the uh, point resistance. One more uh, in situ test. That's uh, very, very useful. And it's called the pressure meter test. Or PMT. Again, what is the PMT as a question on the midterm? Or what do you get from the CPT? And the answer being a profile of point resistance versus depth leading to stratigraphy of the soil. So how does this, and if you, if you want to, uh, if you wonder about when these tests were developed, I would say SPT is around 1910, CPT uh, 1935, and then PMT 1965, we'll see. Okay. U.S., Netherlands, France. <clears throat> so how does the pressure meter test work? Well, we still need a drill rig 
to be able to drill a hole. The hole is drilled, and now you have a hole like this in the ground. And there is some water in the hole somewhere. You then lower, so you drill the hole, you take out the drill, and now you have an open hole. In that open hole, you lower a cylinder, a probe, and the cylinder may be uh, from here to here. And this cylinder, typical, again, same size as the uh, Shelby tube sample, this thin wall steel tube, about 76 millimeters in diameter and about uh, half a meter long. This probe has the ability to expand horizontally. So you have basically a hose tubing that goes back to the surface and here you have a pump. On this pump you can record the pressure and the volume of water that you are sending into the probe. So because the walls of that probe are flexible, rubber, it actually can expand horizontally but not vertically. So if you expand, increase the pressure here, you're going to have something that looks like that. I'm exaggerating because it actually doesn't inflate that much. That's why you need a good hole. And what you measure then, if this is the initial radius, R0, then what you measure is the increase in radius, delta R0. So you start with a certain initial radius, like I said, about 30 millimeters, and then you increase by pushing, so there is a pressure that is generated against the soil on both sides. And so you have, uh, this is the radial stress in the ground. And you can plot the results of a pressure meter test. By plotting uh, sigma r. versus the relative increase in radius, delta R0 over R0. And if you do that, you will get a curve that looks something like that. From O to A, because you were able to get the probe into the hole, there has to be a little bit of a gap. So when you're expanding the probe, the first thing that happens is that it, it inflates and it comes into contact with the borehole wall, and that's zero to A. From A to B, there is a portion of the curve that is quite linear. From this portion of the curve, we will calculate the modulus. We'll call it E0. And then, as you keep pushing, you're failing the soil. So there comes a point where, right here, you reach the limit pressure, PL, of the material that you're testing. We will use PL for the ultimate capacity of the soil. Uh, and then we will use E0 for the uh, settlement calculations. Okay. This is a stress strain curve. So the advantage of this test is more complicated than this one and certainly more complicated than the SPT 
but it gives you a complete stress strain curve. So this whole thing here is a stress strain curve from which you get both an ultimate pressure and a, uh, a modulus. And if you uh, if you've taken uh, a steel behavior and steel design, uh, you do get uh, something like this in steel. Around B is what we often call the yield pressure, P sub Y. Okay? And that's a very important number because you want to stay below this yield pressure or the soil starts to deform as a function of time and that's, uh, that, that's not good. So you want to stay below this pressure in terms of, uh, of what's uh, tolerable. And once you stay below this pressure, then you can use the modulus to calculate how much settlement you're, gonna, you're going to have uh, in, uh, in the structure. So again, sampling and in situ testing. And one is not better than the other. It's important to know what good you can do with sampling or what problems you can solve, what problems you can solve with in-situ testing. In most cases, you will see that the drawbacks of, of this is the advantage of this, and the drawbacks of this are the advantage of that. And so they're really complementary. I'm not saying choose this or choose that. No, you've got to do both. And if you know well what they can do for you, then you can optimize the system. What I want to do in the last few minutes is show you an application of what we do with some of those numbers. So now you're in charge, you're in 1170, and you're the big boss chief engineer, and you're in charge of uh, finding out what the foundation of the Tower of Pisa should be. And you're given here the strength of the material. All right? You don't know what this number is. It's called the Andrain shear strength. But a few lectures from now, you will, you will understand what this is. So this is a shear strength. It's a characterization. We typically get it, we either get it from the pressure meter, or we can get it from uh, samples and so on. But the pressure under the, the tower pizza, weight divided by area, was around 500 kilopascal. This was part of the slides that I showed you. Okay, 500 kilopascal. The ultimate pressure, P sub U, that the sword can resist is six times the Andrean shear strength. Okay, not exactly, but so that means 480 kilopascal. So now here you are building a structure that has a pressure that generates a pressure of 500 kPa, and the maximum the soil can take is 480. You got a problem. Now, the question that you're being asked is. What should be the size of that foundation so that I can have a safe situation? You say, all right, I've got 500 kPa. I need uh, to get a P safe equal to 500 kPa, right? Because then it would be safe. And then the P safe has to be equal to the load divided by the area. So load divided by pi b squared over 4. You know the load, you don't know the size of the, of the circular foundation. And so by this equation, you can uh, find out uh, the p safe Actually, P safe is not 500. That's, that's the uh, pressure that you have. P safe is 480 divided by a factor of safety. Because you know you cannot get 
higher than 480, that's, the, that's what's going to break the soil. So you want to back off from this and go 480 divided by 3, and that's equal to the load divided by 5b squared over 4. You know the load, you know all this, and b is the only thing left. And when you do that, you would find that instead of this uh, dimension here, you would need a foundation that would be about this size and it's about 35 meters instead of 20 so the foundation was too small and then under this condition you would have a much safer uh, pressure okay so we'll see you next time and we will talk about what's the next topic we will talk about particle size we'll be able to identify source but we'll see you next time